We are going to continue today the, to answer questions about the Lord's Church, questions that people raise about the church, about what we teach, and and why. Why uh, much of the teaching of the church is radically different than than most elsewhere, and we ought not apologize for that. It is different. It is unique. It must remain so. And so many of the questions that are raised about the church have to do with the manner of worship and, and uh, of course, the crucial matter of salvation and how one can be certain they're saved and how one can be certain of, of their eternal salvation. The question we'll consider today is to Christians, to we who are trying to live as Christians and live as we ought, to know the life that we're called to live and, and trying to, if I'm out on the road today and suddenly in an instant I'm in a car crash and killed, and in the moment before that, I've been thinking things that I shouldn't or saying things that I shouldn't or I had just committed some sin. If I didn't have a moment to repent of that, what happens the moment I die? Would I be condemned to hell? That's the answer we need to give. Now we need to be able to explain why. <laughs> Okay. Um, the question oftentimes implies that people, members of the church, are, are teaching a works-based kind of salvation. I mean, if I, every minute by minute, if I've got to be, you know, doing something and then examining what I did, whether or not it's, it's wrong, it's, that's not what we're teaching. As the better question is, as one who's living as I know, as we know, that the next moment is promised to no one, then how are we living? To be prepared for the judgment at any time. I really don't take this question lightly about someone suddenly being killed in a car wreck. I'll tell you briefly the story of two car crashes. One was July 3rd, 1981. My entire family was in a car. And if you saw what was left, we hit almost head on a, a drunk driver. Um, if you saw what was left of the car, you would, you'd bet good money that the driver was killed. But I wasn't. I wasn't. And in hindsight, I, I know now that by the manner of my life at that time and not being devoted to, to Christ, I would have been condemned. I know that because the Bible tells me so. But God in his mercy kept me, gave me time to repent, gave me time to change the course of my life. But I'll, another couple in, in Meridian, several years back, their 20-year-old daughter was killed in a crash on the freeway. Road construction, traffic was stopped, and a young man texting on his phone rear-ended her at highway speed. Killed instantly. A good, faithful family. The mother, of course, was distraught, as both parents were. But the mother asked Dina, if she didn't have time to repent, do you think she's condemned? You know, it's, that's all the pain that you feel when you're going through that kind of agony and that loss. And, and, and many of you know similar things to that. Is this, and she asked about her daughter named Megan. If she didn't have time to repent, did she go to hell? It's really a lifestyle question, isn't it? The manner of, of your life is one is walking in a manner worthy of the gospel's calling, living in a God-fearing and a God-revering manner. 
should be counted worthy of God's salvation. We can know that, can't we? Yes, we can. Walking in a, in a manner worthy. So often Paul uses that phrase. And, and in a manner worthy really has nothing to do with meriting one's own salvation like you're trying to examine every thought, uh, every action at every moment, but it is a lifestyle. This manner that is be devoted to Christ, it's befitting of the gospel, it's becoming of, of Christ. The manner worthy, that word means being of a godly sort. Being of a godly sort, what determines if we are a godly sort, sort of people? Paul uses the phrase in in Philippians 3 and verse 17, he says, join in following my example. Join in following my example and, and practice the pattern, he uses the word pattern, that you have seen in us. That's walking as a godly sort. The original word is in the Greek is axios. Sound familiar to anybody? I think there's a internet company or some kind of uh, high-tech corporation called Axios. The original word in the noun form is axiom. What's an axiom? Yes, Tom. That's right. Uh, 317. Yeah. Walking in a manner worthy as you have seen the apostles walk and, and follow the pattern that you have seen in them. And, of course, in You'd have the apostles' example in 1 Peter 2 and verse 14. You'd also have the example, the perfect example left for us by Jesus Christ. But what's an axiom? What's an axiom? It is something that is true and proven of itself. It is a fact that is self-evident. It's invariable. It is a spiritual matter. Well, let's take it as a physical matter. All living things that are deprived of light and air and water and food, what will happen to them? They die. That's an axiom. Not a very positive one, but that's the first one I thought of. But uh, business-wise, uh, an axiom is the, the law of supply and demand that price is relative to supply and demand. That, that's a business axiom. A biblical axiom, a self-evident fact is that the faithful walk as a godly sort of people befitting Christ. And so if we're walking in that matter, what is the assurance from Scripture? That we are, as Tony alluded to, we are covered by grace. If we're walking in that manner, according to that axiom of faith, then we're continually being sprinkled clean by Christ's sacrifice. Paul, uh huh. I, was, I just wanted to add something to see if I'm right. So now, when you were you got in your car wreck at 80 or 1981, mm -hmm. okay, and if you weren't following God the way you needed to be, you know, or just like God hardened Pharaoh's heart because he knew he was never going to turn from his ways, his wicked mm -hmm. ways, so he hardened his heart. And the same thing with us as we are. I mean, look at all the stuff that I did in my life, and God knew that I would be a good servant later on, and so he spared me. So all that time, I was still living under grace and didn't even know it because God spared me from death so I could, because he's not in time. God has no time. Mm -hmm. So he already knew that I would be serving him, and I could use what I learned from the world as a good example to help other people. So well, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, we don't understand all the ways that God works and how he is preserving and keeping. It. But, I, you know, I, now having given myself to some study, I can look back and I can evaluate that. My heart, I wasn't devoted to him. Oh, I was kind of quote-unquote good member of a church, but you can do that and just be sitting in the pew. And, and otherwise, you know, yeah, my heart wasn't in it. And he would, he would know that. But mercifully, he allowed me time. 
and all the ways that worked between 1981 and the years following this, it, it was his gracious keeping, I'm convinced. But the day this other girl died, she had been sewing on her wedding dress. She had been over at her future mother-in-law's house sewing on the wedding dress. And I suspect what was on her mind was a faithful young woman getting set to marrying a, a kind Christian young man, and she wasn't thinking about sin. I don't really think she needed to worry about it, though, because of the manner of life that she was living. The, the, again, the question when raised against the churches of Christ sometimes implies that, well, we're, we're having to work for it moment by moment. But we know from Scripture, Ezekiel 18, that God, no, God takes no pleasure in the death of one who is unprepared for the judgment. On the other hand, Psalm 116 and verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his godly ones. Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord. I love that verse. Is the death of one of his godly ones. Why? How could that be precious? Because God's work's completed in that one, isn't it? He has kept them. And his work is complete in that one. That faith that was effective in preserving their soul. God is protecting his, his precious possession. What's the answer then if somebody asks you that question? How do you answer that? Quickly. What do you say? God judges the thoughts and the intention of every man's heart. He examines that. He knows that. He knows the life that we have devoted ourselves to live or the life that we're carelessly living apart from Christ. Yes, sir. And you mentioned faithfulness. Uh-huh. Faithfulness doesn't infer imperfection. You're never going to be perfect. Good point. Good point. You're not perfect, but you're still devoted to it. It's, it's that covenant that you've made and the steadfast devotion to it. It is trying to give your best to it. Um, when the person's living that kind of life, God certainly knows. Looks like you're deep in thought, Dan. Well, I just, I just as soon as you started the conversation, I heard first John 3, chapter 3. And the thing is, Yep. A sin doesn't necessarily separate us instantly from God. Nope, it doesn't. And that's where the problem comes in. If I've done something wrong, and then, but it's, it was just a mess up on my part, I die in a car accident, I'm still under God's grace. Right. God makes it very clear that there's a difference between just sinning and practicing sin. Right. And if we're practicing sinner, which you refer to maybe that's how you were, before mm -hmm. you change, and we've all been there at times. But if you're a practicing sinner, then you have separated yourself from God, so you're no longer under that grace until you repent at that point. Yeah. And so we got to be careful. You know, like Paul, like they tell Paul, so shall we sin so we get more grace? <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> Indeed not. Uh, I always love the way he answers that. May it never, in no way, no how, be misconstrued as that. But even, uh, we'll touch on it in the lesson a little while this morning, even in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, when God's talking to his covenant people, he said, your sins and your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. He's talking about the practice of sin. By that time, they had already determined, we don't care, essentially, we don't care what you say, God, we're going to do our own thing. You know, that's why he describes it in the words, your sins and your, first he says iniquities, your sin, iniquities and your sins. It's that rebellious attitude that makes the separation. So, I appreciate what you said, Roger, about marriage and about so many relationships. What is, 
what is how, how are you investing yourself in that oh I've got plenty of faults as a husband and a dad as well but how are you investing yourself in that what's the what's the desire of your heart and so indeed we need not fear that if we are living as a matter of lifestyle seeking to do seeking to be what we should be let's consider another question why does the church of christ insist their name is scriptural when it cannot be found anywhere in the bible the church is refer referred to as the church of god eight times that's right but is never called the church of christ where does the Bible call the church, the church of Christ? At the basis of this, it's still an argument against the Ephesians 4 scripture that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church. There, we find in scripture, whether it is said the churches of Christ or the church, it's singular or plural, it's the same. I can prove it to you. He makes the point that the church is called the church of God eight times. There are also times when it's called plural churches of God. What we find in scripture is a description of the church which then is used as a name. Uh, Hebrews 12 verse 23 refers to the church of the firstborn. Hebrews 12, verse 23. That is a description of who we are. Being born of God's Son, that first of a type of what we ought to be, that nature of that Son, church of the firstborn. In that same verse, it dis we're described as a general assembly, the church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven. There's three descriptions of who we are, isn't it? Actually four, church of the firstborn. The general assembly, the words, the original words means the universal called out. All who universally have been called out by the gospel, set apart by the gospel, general assembly. We could be called that. That's a little vague, a little confusing, isn't it? Also described as the church, those who are enrolled in heaven. All of those are descriptions. Why do we, as he says, insist on the name Church of Christ? You know, we, we, we could, according to Acts chapter 2, we could put on the sign, those who belong to Christ. That's Acts chapter 9 and verse 2. Those who belong to Christ. Or... We're also described, actually there it says, those who are belonging to the way. Could we put that on, on the sign, belonging to the way? It would be an accurate description, it's a little vague, which, Acts 9 verse 2, uh, be a little vague, wouldn't it? Which way? You know. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's many, many, there's many ways we could rightly describe who we are. Many ways. So why do most churches of Christ stand by the name the Church of Christ? Well, some who aren't are in fact causing a great deal of confusion, to be truthful about it. But how did we come to use that as our name? Because we are called that in Acts 11 and verse 26. Those who belong to Christ are called Christians. And when you have an assembly of Christians, that general assembly, the universally called out, when you have an assembly of Christians, it's collectively a church, and many assemblies are, are churches of Christ. Well, the objection is it's never said in the singular. But... Notice this, in Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul speaks of the 
singular, the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. That is the singular, universal church, the general assembly, the church of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, he writes to the church of God. So it, it's the name for all who have been sanctified universally, worldwide. But there in Corinthians, he's only writing to one place, isn't he? The church in Corinth, the one congregation. It, or I shouldn't say it that way. Is it to only one church? No, it's not. It, it's not. Again, the words mean those who are universally called out. And he even describes it as there. It is all who in every place, he writes to the church of God, all who are in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever the assemblies of the sanctified are gathered, wherever they're calling on the Lord's name, they are singularly the church of God. But in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 16, then Paul is speaking to individuals in one place. Now he is speaking to one congregation. Relative to the practices of, what's he, there he says, churches of God. So in one place he's talking singular, applying to all. In another place he's talking to an individual place and, and calling it in the plural. Singular, plural, it's still the same body, is it not? And so it is with the church of Christ. It doesn't have to say the church of Christ. Because whether it is one place or many places, it's the same body. And so it's really a... In some people's mind, I, I won't say it. I started to say it's just semantics. No, it's not. The church of Christ is who we are, and what it is, that's what we'll be called. To call it something else is just to sow confusion, and we're never to be that. I, one of the sad things is congregations who have been affiliated with the churches of Christ now call themselves by a name that mentions neither Christ nor church. In one sense, that's sad, but in another sense, it's, it might be best because those who do so have often departed from the faith in some ways. Some great big congregations have, that have gone to, I don't know, Riverside Fellowship, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, in the part of the country, uh, over in Bible Belt land, there's... There's some congregations that have taken to calling themselves a Church of Christ instead of the. And you think, well, does that matter? Well, yes, it does. It sounds like a, like many different kinds of a, much like the translation of the Bible that refers to a God instead of the God. You go back and look in the manner, in the way it's worded in the original language, that Paul uses, it's very specific. There's like a the in every word. It's like the church of the Christ. And it's it's emphatic. It's an axiom, yes. So there's a rule of interpretation. You can't interpret a scripture that causes contradiction in another. You mentioned this one church. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's important. The, uh, but as as you see it there in Scripture, whether Paul's writing singular or plural, to the singular applying it to the many, or to the many applying it to the one, it's the same body, and so it is a perfectly valid name. It is who we are. It sets us apart as a unique kind of people who are all bought in the same manner, set apart people. And again, to use something else is just sowing confusion, isn't it? We ought not be flinching or ashamed of being bought by Christ. 
Another question, if the church of Christ claims to worship God only as authorized by Scripture, because they sing only and do not use instrumental music, then where do they get the authority to use hymnals and pitch pipes and pews and indoor baptistries in their worship service? How can we do all of that? He's really asking about that little pitch pipe. Go ahead. So the pitch pipe, you got to look at, does it change worship? To me, it's pitch pipe to me. Uh, we drink uh, the words through you know, a cup out of a, a little plastic cup. That's an aid. It has nothing to do with what uh, the worship activity. Doesn't matter if it's a glass cup or a plastic one? That's, yeah. It's, the, uh, it's facilitating. Right. Does it change yeah. the worship What's the big overarching issue? General authority versus specific authority, isn't it? Where there's a specific command that we have to do it as it's specifically commanded. When it is given as a general command, you first have to consider that you cannot go beyond that command. What's the Great Commission? Go therefore into all the world and teach the gospel. Did it say to do so by what means? Didn't didn't limit that at all. It said go. Yeah, go ahead. And the same thing with singing. You know, it says to sing. It's solo. It said to play. We, we would all have to play. Yeah. That's real specific. The. Uh, I think, I think, by and large, it is a, a matter of authority. Are you going to hold uh, the Word of God as being the authority? Ephesians 1, God has put all things in, under subjection to Christ and under His rule, under His administration, according to the Word. It's, it is the case of aids versus additions. The when God told Noah to build an ark, could he do it without tools? I don't know how. <laughs> you know, it had to, I mean, even if it's just sticking the wadding between the boards to make the thing waterproof, you've got to have a tool. It's just an aid to carry out the command. In Colossians 3 and verse 17, there it says, whatever you do, Whatever you do, you're, you do by the authority of the name. By the authority of the name, again, this matter of who is God put in rule over us? Who are we, to whom are we in subjection? If we're going to do God's command, it has to be as he has said. AIDS, as, as Roger has pointed out, just assist in carrying out the command. It's an expediency. If we're all going to sing spiritual songs and hymns to encourage one another, then we all have to know the words, don't we? You all have to simply know the words. For all can sing, all need to know the words to sing. Acts 20 and verse 7 is a specific command. Look at Acts 20 and verse 7. Most of you won't even have to turn there to know what it is. But let's do anyway. On the first day of the week, when we are gathered together, there's two specifics. First day, gathering to break bread. Paul began to talk to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. The crucial part of it is what's specifically commanded. The day and the assembling. And so... That cannot be changed as, as much as people want to today, to do it on other days of the week, to do it not in a worship assembly, but for a wedding or for a child's christening or for, for whatever. That's beyond the command. That's an addition then. And so there, there, here's, there's five rule, rules for this to, to sort it out. There has to be a command. And that command must be seen in light of all the scripture. It cannot, it, and it will not in God's word. It doesn't contradict. 
And so an aid, an aid is not going to be expressly stated. But the point of all of it is, as you've alluded to in what you've said, it must edify everybody. It must edify everyone. An aid then also cannot be bound. I can't bind on, Roger and I use a pitch pipe, but I can't bind on Jeff to use a pitch pipe. I can't bind on him even to do this stuff. It works for me. You ever seen some guy try to do that, doesn't know what he's doing? That's a mess. <laughs> we had, well, that's all right. I mean, but it works for me. It keeps me moving. Sure don't do it to be distracting. If it was that, then I would certainly stop. But you can't bind that on anybody. So why do we use it? Why do we use it? Well, because it doesn't contradict an established law. It helps to edify. It doesn't violate Scripture. Unless I could play that thing like a harmonica. And frankly, sometimes when I'm trying to learn the melody by myself, I play it like one. I go, hoo, 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 hoo. yeah. But I'm not doing that for us to sing by. That's so we can establish the melody. Additions add to God's command with no authority to do so. Musical instruments do not help to fulfill the commandment. They actually contradict it. And so they're, they're violating that specific authority. The, to make the singing edifying, it does need to be at a, a proper pitch, doesn't it? Sometimes proper pitch is just as it is written. Generally speaking, for most congregations, congregational singing, proper pitch is a little lower than it's written. Just a little lower than it's written. I was reading a good article a while back. It was talking what's happening these days in in congregational working worship with so many of the new songs and and so many of some of the new songs are more performance oriented than worship oriented. In this that's a long discussion, but if people don't sense that they can join in together and they actually can contribute to the teaching of one another, they're going to go quiet on you. Yes, Mary? I, I visited uh, congregations before that and I noticed that the congregation was very quiet. Well, it, the, the person that's out there leading singing should do everything he can to well, facilitate. Oh, yeah. She was singing and you were listening. Yeah. There was no else I'm jumping to our situation here, though. But here, the person out there leading should do everything he can. He, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I don't know why I said that. Everything he can to facilitate everyone being involved in the scene, to try to get the pitch where everyone can see, to try to set a tempo that is appropriate to the song, sometimes more often than not to keep it moving. <laughs> um, pitch is important. Sometimes you can, you can sing it a little lower. If, if somebody gets it too low, you can make the happiest song sound like a dirge. I always call it, you know, sometimes people sing in the key of uh, whatever uh first comes out of their mouth. That's the key of uh. But in a, we do have a responsibility to, to make it such that people can all enthusiastically join. Sometimes we might slip in a new song. But in the in the in the main, the worship needs to be so everybody can participate in it. And whatever we do, whether it's a, a songbook, projecting the words on the wall, on a screen, all, all of that's just a manner of, of 
getting everybody to where they can in unison sing. In fact, even of even that one tree, he said, don't eat of it. They were free to choose to do so. That's right. You know, but doing so went beyond. But to keep scriptural, they didn't yeah. eat of any other tree that they, that they wanted. They didn't have to eat of every tree. Nope. Except the one. So, you know, that's how our and it, and it does get down to just that. What is the spirit in the person? If you have a spirit to be submissive and obedient, do you have a spirit to just push the limit as far as you can? Well, I was going to say that exact same thing. The praise team says they're the best singers, right? We're going to like them. Yeah. That changes the whole version. Yeah. Uh, there is that. not singing. Who says they're the best? Singer? Maybe the worst singer in the congregation, God appreciates them because they're singing from the heart. I have, every time anybody has told me they can't sing, I would, you, if, or often have said, you go outside and you stand at one of, by one of the doorways to a little kid's classroom and half of them can't carry a tune. Have you ever heard a sound sweeter than that? Our, I don't know who I mean, our, the minister and his wife that were in Linder Road when we first went there in the early 90s. Whew, she's tough to listen to. I mean, if you want to pick it apart about how well she can hit the notes and that, it's tough. But you never heard a more joyful noise because her heart is in it. And that's perfect. <laughs> that's it. And that's what he wants. Would it be nice if everybody? I don't think it'd be any better at all if everybody could sing every note perfectly. Wouldn't be real. He wants what we can give. What what he gave us is a good spirit by which we ought to sing. Didn't didn't demand the quality of the singing. He demanded the quality of the heart to give it to him. Uh, I I love singing. Uh, and nothing's better when you get a bunch of people together that are singing from the heart. And a bunch of them don't know how, if you want to get technical about it. But God put something in us. We can memorize songs. Mm -hmm. uh, you sing a song, it sticks, and you go sing it all day long. And uh, that's a phenomenal. Hey, I make it through many a day doing that. If you ever somebody bugged my car and recorded with the noise you hear in my car, it'd be something else. But uh, that's good. It's part of that joy. Uh, I think it does. All these questions have to do, to a certain extent, what's the spirit in you? Do you want to keep challenging God? Do you just want to see what you can, how far you can push, or you just want to say, God, this is, yeah, just this is what you desire, God. This is what I'm going to give. I guess we better wrap it up there for now. <laughs>